like to call the meeting to order, and this is the Committee on City Service, and I would like to do a roll call. Um, we have Dennis Bidwell, who's the counselor for Ward 2. We have sitting beside him is Councilor Jim Nash from Ward 3, and I'm City Councilor Mary Ellen Barge, Vice Chair, and also Maureen Carney, our chair, is not here today due to a death in her family. Public comment, I see that there's no public comment. Um, I would like um, the approval of the minutes of February 5th, uh, February, what was the date? Uh, 5th. February what? 5th, same 5th. No approval, very second minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We have with us, and I would like to recognize Chief Jody Casper, our North Denton, uh, from the North Denton Police Department, and the Director of our Health Department, Meredith O'Leary. The reasons why we've asked you to come to our committee is that there are some concerns from us city councilors on this committee related to inspections and enforcement of regulations regarding retail marijuana. So, counselors, um, you're open up to discussion. Ask questions. Okay. Councilor Bidwell. Well, okay. why don't it, it was kind of my, indeed. So it was kind of my idea to in, invite both of you here to speak to, uh, you know, because we, we're looking at, uh, we have retail marijuana coming along, and that uh, much of the focus is around, um, you know, zoning and size of the businesses and all that kind of stuff. But um, we thought it would be good to have a discussion around, you know, just the, the basics of, you know, that these businesses are going to be kind of um, under the heading of like um, the way you um, oversee a food business. There's that aspect. And then also, you know, what other increased enforcement issues that you might anticipate coming down the road. So that was the general idea. I don't know how you want to go about this or sure. yeah, if Meredith wants to start with enforcement inspection stuff. Sure, why don't I go? I you know, I've been thinking about this for a while now, probably <laughs> since you know, a couple of years before um, medical marijuana came into town. Um, and here's some I've kind of put together just a brief little packet for you that kind of gives you an overview of some of our public health concerns that we have. And then what we can do is if you have questions from there. We can go on because um, there are some public health impacts that you know are have a broader scope and then we can hone in on like enforcement inspections food animals all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so it takes all levels of government to ensure a comprehensive strategy okay, go, <laughs> a comprehensive strategy is in place to mitigate the potential harms from legalization and sale of recreational cannabis an effective public health strategy will require collaboration of among many, meaning uh, police departments, education, health, government leaders like yourself. It's not gonna be done in a vacuum. We have to look at this as a systems issue. Um, so with the onset of commercial legalization of marijuana, public health concerns that arise, and I should probably look at this myself, that I've kind of outlined here are the risk, risk of toxicity, unintended exposure to children and adults, um, high mortality, morbidity, occupational safety risks, negative mental health outcomes, respiratory health effects, impaired children and youth development, child and youth development. Um, I know that you guys have sat through uh, a couple presentations now from NPC, Spiffy, and they talk to you about the developing brain. You know, your brain's not fully developed, they're saying now until the age of 24. So youth access is a huge concern. So what, I, uh, what I've included in here is some public health strategies that we can use to help protect our youth and things that we should be considering. So access, limiting the number of establishments, location, and having a minimum age requirement set is hugely important when it comes to protecting our youth. Research suggests that widespread availability of regulated substances, substances such as alcohol and tobacco, it's hard to put this in context with marijuana because we don't have that research, right? It suggests it results in the normalization, increased establishments, results in the normalization of youth use and undermines health risks associated with use. Contextual cues 
can play a significant role in shaping one's perspective to the magnitude of harms associated with, reg with regulated substances, right? We see perception of harm goes down to a substance. We see increased use, okay? Over the years, we have increased the perception of harm of tobacco use, and over the years, we have seen youth use go down. <coughs> um, so, minim so that is number of establishments and location, if we can really kind of look at that. Then, minimum age requirement of 21. The, the regulation, the draft regulation as it's written now, States, you have to be 21 to purchase recreational marijuana. However, there's a little, uh, when, we, when it looks closely at types of establishments, when you have mixed use establishments, you don't have to be 21 to go into a mixed use establishment. So if we have, say, Kathy Cross that decides, and I use this <laughs> example to be funny, but if she decides to sell marijuana, recreational marijuana, in her establishment, which she could, she, beca she can become a mixed use establishment, you can be any age to go into that establishment. And I'm suggesting to council that we actually have a ordinance in place that says you have to be 21 or older to go into an establishment that sells marijuana. In fact, I would like establishments that, sm that sell recreational marijuana only sell marijuana. I wouldn't want to see any type of mixed use establishments in, in our city. Um, so you're looking at right now of an ordinance in place, and who would do that? The, the, the board? Well, I'd like to. It should be a uh, should be an ordinance coming from council. Mm -hmm. That would be my suggestion at this point. Okay. So then we have unintended exposure. The unintended exposure of uh, uh, children, especially excuse me to to mar let's talk about edibles yeah. at first before I go to the rest. So. Um, Children six years age and younger have unintended exposures to edibles. Edibles are just a marijuana-infused product. Edibles, as it's written in the draft regulation, really, they do a nice job in saying edibles have to be individually wrapped. If edibles are not individually wrapped, then they have to be clearly demarked on what a serving size is. So they do a nice job around regulating them, but again, we want to change our focus to preventing the youth from getting them accidentally. So, yeah? So you're saying that edibles are packaged by the dose? They tend they, to be? Is that what it, they sell over at Meta? So if they're not packaged by the dose, meaning individually wrapped, right. They have to be clearly demarked. So if we have a, ch a chocolate bar, oh, it's got a, yeah, one serving right. size has to be clearly marked what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So in Colorado, they there's research done by call, you know getting uh, statistics from poison control centers and from EDs on acc accidental ingestion from children six years and under excuse me, five years and, young, and younger. When, when medical marijuana was legal in Colorado, the incident rates went up to 135% of accidental ingestion of children. When recreational marijuana became legal in Colorado, that number dropped, dropped to, uh, excuse me, increased to 225% calls to poison control and healthcare visits. For edibles. For edibles. So one of the strategies that I was thinking about, in addition to what um, the regulation has in place now, is having exit packages being given to the consumer at the point of sale. So right now, edibles come in this childproof packaging. But once you've opened that childproof packaging, you can't secure it again in, a lot of times in the original package that it came in to make sure that it's childproof or child resistant. So one of the things that I'm, I'm asking to, you know, to be in our host agreement or somewhere is that every retail establishment, if they're going to sell edibles, provide exit packages. To what? So it's a package that 
outside of your original package, if you only take that single serving size and you have leftovers of your edible, goes into this exit package, exit package and is now becomes child proof because you're going to zip it up, secure it up, whatever the form may be. Okay. So it's now tamper proof from children. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, and the folks from Netta spoke that they have packaging. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, is that very? Yes. That's it's what just you're talking like about. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So if who, if the future establishments, mm -hmm. including Netta's retail mm -hmm. portion, followed that procedure, we that would be good. Yeah, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. they sounded like they were going to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. I would think so. I think you know they, um, you know they invested a lot of time in thinking this out carefully. You know working with the different department heads, you know, what can we do to ensure public health and safety? So they invest a lot of time and money and research and doing it right. And so I think that will carry through to the recreational side also. And you know, I think they can actually serve as model examples to any other retail um, establishment that's coming in. You know, we set them to the standard three or four years ago when they came into town. We should be setting our recreational establishments to those same standards. Mm -hmm. Just, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. so, I think it's pretty clear that the council can pass an ordinance regarding age, regarding a cap. The the packaging is so heavily described in the CCC mm -hmm. regs. Yep. Is there discretion at the city level to so, also impose additional packaging I'm requirements? I'm hoping in our host agreement that there will be that some be rules for, for that. that. Yeah. As yeah. opposed to by ordinance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The host agreement should mm -hmm. give us a lot of. Um, latitude on what we want to, what our expectations are of our establishments. And then if it, for some reason we couldn't include it or embed it into our host agreement, then maybe it would be a public health regulation. That's where it would have to lay. Mm -hmm. So now the mayor has mentioned about the host agreement. Mm -hmm. So would that mean that you'd be working mm -hmm. along with the Absolutely. mayor and your mm -hmm. board yep. on that? Yeah. 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 There's a, that. It, this is the opportunity. This host agreement is the opportunity where we have our voice, our public health voice, our government voice, things that aren't covered in zoning or ordinances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a boilerplate in the works. Yeah, yeah. Where are we going to be able to have enforcement when there's a problem now, right? With mm -hmm. out staff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both the police department and the health department. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do there of uh, being able to regulate, make mm -hmm. sure they are doing what they're supposed mm -hmm. to be doing, mm -hmm. and where are we going to get the enforcement mm -hmm. to right. make it happen mm -hmm. that they have to make sure that they follow the regulations. Right, right. So this, the state is saying that there won't need to be local enforcement from the health department, that they are going to inspect places that sell not just retail, uh, you know, um, recreational marijuana in its whole form, but also in other different forms, meaning edibles, so on and so forth. So they're, they're taking the onus off public health. Is that going to be good enough? I'm not sure. I don't know what you know state inspections are going to look like, and they might look a little different, you know, year one versus year five. I know the state. Um, we have state inspectors that inspect um, beauty salons, you know, people who do cosmetology and hair, provide hair services. But if our salons in our town and our communities receive one inspection, you know, every other year, that's considered a lot. They just don't have. The manpower, but again, you know, I think year one, two, and three, why this is all new, and we've got this funding stream coming in. Inspections will be done five years from now. I'm not so sure. Right. The but again, one. just because they're saying we don't have to doesn't, you know, we should entertain the conversation. Should we be? The health department inspects every food establishment, whether it's retail or you're preparing food here in the city of Northampton. Should we do? Should we do the same for marijuana? I'm not sure. I don't have that answer. Because the reason why I'm questioning this, I have many friends who are hairdressers. Mm -hmm. They only have one hairdresser inspector throughout the whole state. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And come on. Mm -hmm. 15 years ago when I was public health, it was double we had two. Mm -hmm. oh. So you can see how it, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, also, 
you know, things that we need to be thinking about when it comes to our youth. Passive exposure, you know. Um, passive ex exposure should be looked at the same as we do with tobacco, right? If we, you know, we think about secondhand smoke a lot and all the, the, the negative health effects associated with that, well, we have to think about, you know, secondhand smoke of marijuana for our children and what does that look like? And again, there's not a lot of research in terms of um, secondhand marijuana smoke and the developing brain because it is all too new. But I think it's my job as a public health um, professional to be looking ahead, you know. Um, we, we, we're starting with the data collection now. We're going to be using the strategic framework model and doing health analysis and needs assessments throughout the whole course of this, the life of marijuana here in, in the city like we do with tobacco. But again, it's so hard to predict what the future is going to bring. I think that we owe it to our children to start thinking about this now. And when I think about passive exposure, I mean, we should be thinking about maybe prohibiting or having some type of ordinance of marijuana smoking in multifamily housing. I know it's not allowed or going to be allowed in our housing authority properties because they're funded federally and drugs aren't allowed. And you gotta remember, this is still an illicit um, <coughs> stage one drug, you know? So I don't know if they're gonna be enforcing it. Our, our, our Northampton Housing Authority properties are smoke free and they have this policy, but they don't even enforce that. So I know they don't. Right. I, I know that for a fact There's too. They have a lot of smokers. Huh? They have a lot of smokers. They have a lot of smokers. Smoker but house. <laughs> last June, June first, two thousand seventeen, they said smoking is now prohibited. Yeah. But yet they're not doing anything. And a policy or a law or a regulation is only as good as the enforcement. So I think we owe it to our children to think about, you know, multi multi family properties and and smoking of marijuana in those properties. The, in your department, do you design ordinances? Regulations, health regulations. Okay. So they're law. They're just as strong. Right, like no smoking on Main Street. Mm -hmm. You can do that. I can do that as long as they're right, as long as there's some public health evidence-based data behind doing something. Right, because many people now are complaining of people smoking Mm -hmm. on Main Street, mm -hmm. and I can see where mm -hmm. that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to have people smoking marijuana, mm -hmm. you know, Could and be. I don't yeah. want to smell that. Mm -hmm. exactly. So what do we do here? Right. So the, my board and I have entertained discussions in the past about um, having either a buffer zone in the business district, a smoke-free buffer zone, which is like 20 feet from the buildings because then that would eliminate smoking on the sidewalks or just having a smoke-free downtown areas. Uh, we get many complaints, when I say many, maybe about 20 a year um, about you know nuisance smoke yes. in the downtown business area. We get it from our patrons and we also get it from our business owners. Okay. One of the problems that we have is you know you have a food service establishment and you have you know someone who's smoking outside the door or the open window and the smoke is coming into the establishment. And as a business owner, that's actually an infraction of the smoke, you know, the state smoke-free workplace law and our local public health regulations around tobacco. Well, you know, people so, are sitting on the sidewalk right. and on the benches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I see it. Mm -hmm. And they're smoking. Absolutely. Like you go to walk mm -hmm. by with children or anybody, it's, it's awful. One of the good things that we did in one of our recent uh, amendments of our tobacco regulation is we redefine what smoking is and smoking now is um, any combustible so it includes it includes e-cigarettes it includes vaping in there so there's this big umbrella of what smoking actually is so wherever smoking is prohibited right now so will be the smoking of marijuana it's going to look the same but again we're talking about enforcement we don't have the manpower to enforce. So, um, so that's passive exposures, public use. We want to make sure that um, we're providing education to our youth. This is really important. Embedding key evidence-based messaging about risky use, especially for our youth is going to be essential to help deter youth in the future. So one of the things that I, uh, I've looked at in the past, because I work a lot around opioid substance use, 
is life skills training, providing this training to our teachers that who can and then embed it into not only just health education courses, but you can teachers who teach math or teach science or geography can embed this training into their regular curriculum. It doesn't have to be because I know over the years health curriculum has gotten slashed. So they don't have a designated, you know, um, quarter or semester of health curriculum anymore. But if you can weave this into our regular everyday curriculum, it, it proves that it's beneficial. And again, it will hopefully deter initial use of any substance, not just marijuana or opioids, but tobacco, alcohol, so on and so forth. Funding campaigns. I think it's huge, you know, funding campaigns, education campaigns with some of the taxation money that we're gonna, gonna receive to provide youth with ongoing, reliable information on the risks and harms associated with cannabis use is going to be key to developing, you know, to, to deterring children from using. Um, what else on here? Impaired driving, developing a comprehensive framework which includes prevention, education, and enforcement to address and prevent marijuana impaired driving. It's, is, no, is, is going to be beneficial. Um, I have, I am fortunate to have three beautiful girls, two of them who are over the age of 21 now and one who is a senior in high school. And they look at impaired driving differently for alcohol and marijuana. Gotcha. My kids know, you don't drink and drive, period. My kids and their friends don't associate that with smoking some marijuana and driving. So I think getting that information out on drug driving, what that looks like, impaired driving, is going to be key, okay? And again, this is not just public health, this is public safety also, which Jody will, I'm sure, dovetail on that a lot. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the youth component that I was thinking about. And then there's kind of some overall public health safety things that we should, we should be looking at. And when I think where I'm going to have the biggest bang for my buck, like where am I going to have an impact, it's really going to be on communication and education. So I talked a little bit of, about edibles when it came to our youth, but we have to talk about edibles on a whole. So a, pop a popular alternative delivery device of marijuana, instead of smoking or vaping it, is eating it, okay? eating a marijuana-infused food product. That's what an edible means. Edibles pose a very unique risk or concern that isn't present in the other forms. Users don't usually feel their effect of an edible until about 45 minutes up to three hours after ingesting it. And failure of the adult user to appreciate that delayed effect of the, uh, of the marijuana intoxication of of, you know, with the THC is in fact why people have what we call marijuana intoxications. They've taken their serving size, they've waited their half an hour, they're not feeling anything, they're waiting an hour, they're not feeling anything. You're going to take another serving size. Then you're going to have accumulation of that THC effect and that's when you have marijuana intoxication. And marijuana intoxication, some of the symptoms that it poses is paranoia, psychotic, psychotic thoughts, um, palpitations of the heart, increased heart rate, um, panic attacks, so on and so forth. So there's actually one documented case of uh, a 19 year old who died because of marijuana intoxication from an edible. Um, I think it was out in Colorado, I can't remember where it was from. But when we look at emergency room or healthcare visits due to uh, marijuana edibles, there's been in, in, in uh, states that have legalized it, there has been a 17% increase in healthcare visits because of marijuana edibles for adults. So, so we want to have, uh huh? When you're talking about the edibles plus versus smoking it, mm -hmm. I don't understand that. If 
you're smoking a cigarette. It's the way we metabolize it. So that's going through your whole circulatory system and it's getting to your happy or pleasure center a lot faster than going through your digestive system and getting up to your pleasure center. Okay. So that's why it takes so long to feel those effects. Gotcha. I think one of the places, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the analogy is, is better with like drinking. You know, if you take a drink, you don't feel it right away, but 10, 15 minutes, you start to feel the mm -hmm. effects of it. Mm -hmm. with, with, the, the, with edibles, it's even more delayed mm -hmm. than that. And, and in fact, that delay gets a lot of young drinkers in trouble because they go and take a shot and they're like, oh, I don't mm -hmm. feel anything. They take another mm -hmm. shot and they, they can end up being really intoxicated, so. Humans by nature just like immediate gratification. And that's and where the vaping and the smoking yeah. actually mm -hmm. has some sort of advantage because it, you're, mm -hmm. you're registering much sooner what it is yeah. you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. besides, not, to, not to go and say people should do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, besides you, the edibles is my number one concern that I have. I think um, where I can have the greatest impact is on public health messaging around edibles. And one thing that I'm going to suggest to the mayor in terms of the host agreement is making sure that at every point of sale, if you're selling marijuana-infused food products, that you have something like I included on here, some type of public education around you know about edibles. Start slow, go you know go slow. Start with one serving. Wait, you know, 45 minutes to three hours before you do your next serving. I think we really owe it to the consumer to have very clear, concise messaging around edibles. Other places where I'd like to see great communication or health uh, or education is around um, health <coughs> education. There's strong evidence that suggests cannabis and tobacco smoke are equally carcinogenic. Um, they both contain, you know, bronchial irritants, tumor promoters, carcinogens. Negative negative respiratory outcomes may appear from um, from smoking both. So I think having health education. Provide it every point of sale is going to benefit our consumer. Visitor information, you know, we are going to be a destination area for people to come in and buy their cannabis from out of town, from out of state. The people who are coming to the city of Northampton need to know the laws, your local laws around recreational marijuana, where to use it, where you can't use it, how much can you have on you, and they need to know the state laws around it too. So providing that at every point of sale is going to be huge. Smoke-free public places right now, you know, our municipal-owned parks and recreation area, meaning our bike path, Pulaski Park, so on and so forth. These are all smoke-free areas. Even so, the bus stop? It is, yeah. yeah well, they smoke mm -hmm. like crazy in there. We just put new signs up with PBTA. I know, I know. So we're hoping that it helps. It was just one sign before, now we have three very large signs there but we need to kind of um we need to look at those signs a little differently now because all of our signs are that big red circle with a cigarette in the middle right. and the line going through it saying no smoking cigarettes right but we want this to be comprehensive meaning no smoking anything whatever that looks like that so we sense. really need to look at that um that messaging again as this is coming down the road Drug driving and then, oh, information accessing support services. You know, um, we do that for opioids, we do that for cigarettes at point of sale. We want to make sure that we're doing that also for marijuana. And the last part of education that's hugely important is around safe storage. Again, not just for youth, but for older adults, for anyone coming to visit your house. You want to make sure that, as we do with prescription drugs, that our marijuana is put away in a safe area where people don't have access. A few other things in terms of overall <clears throat> public health and safety, we want to make sure, and this isn't included in the CCC that I put in the regulations, um, but it might change because during the public hearings that they held, a lot of people talked about training their staff and educating their staff um, who are going to, you know, at point of sale are going to be checking out people who, consumers who are buying uh, recreational marijuana, make sure that they are educated themselves, make sure that they can disseminate the proper information to the consumer, so on and so forth. And then the other thing that wasn't included in the um, draft regulation 
was mobile sales of marijuana. They cover delivery, and that's going to be put off till October along with social consumption, because those are two other very large conversations that need to be had, you know, after phase one here. But prohibiting mobile sales of marijuana, I think, again, that should probably come from the city council as an ordinance. Um, we don't want to see, like, your ding-dong cart selling ice cream. We don't want to see a ding-dong cart selling marijuana. And what I envision is, you know, at the three county fair, when we have all these mobile food trucks, you know, we're now seeing a different type of mobile food truck out there, whether it be, you know, edibles or whatever form of recreational marijuana that we're saying they're selling. For tobacco in our regulation locally here at the health department, we require that you have a permanent structure, brick and mortar structure to become a merchant of tobacco. And I think that should be the same thing for recreational marijuana. Permanent structure? Yep, yep. And don't we have that same regulation for selling food? For food. food? We, don't, we don't allow food trucks, right? We don't allow them down the business district, but we do allow food right. trucks oh, at okay. events right. and private property, so on right. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying the brick and mortar requirement on tobacco, is, is, that's public health reg? Or yeah, that's a public it's... health regulation, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're suggesting if it were to be for marijuana, it should come in the form of an ordinance. It should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys already have an ordinance on mobile vending. Maybe it's just an, mm -hmm. an, issue, you know, an amendment thereof. Mm -hmm. Do they, in any other like Colorado or wherever, do they actually have mobile trucks that stop? They do. They mm -hmm. do? They do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we need, we're learning from their mistakes, so we have the opportunity to, to do it right, you know. And have they had have problems with that? I'm not sure, you know. Anecdotally, I'm sure there are some scary. things that people talk about, but mm -hmm. I don't have any, any evidence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a nutshell, I think we really need to invest in our future. I think we need to... Um, if I was going to ask for two things, you know, it would really be investing on health education, okay? Taking some of that 3% and make sure that we look at substance use on a whole, not just in these little kind of silos that we've been doing. You know, I've got the tobacco component here. I've got this whole new um, opioid prevention center in the health department now over here. We need to have sustainable health prevention people in the health department. All of my prevention people right now are grant funded. These grants end in two years. Where are we left then, you know? Um, so I think we need to invest in our future for sustainability when it comes to prevention. And then we need to invest in local compliance and enforcement. Those would be my two asks. and. So is that the handoff to enforcement? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a nice segue. It was, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, just what, what Meredith just mentioned about Colorado, it, it is nice. We have existing states that have already gone through this. So it's very easy to look at their data and take a look at how things are going and use that as kind of a springboard for how we're thinking about our own ordinance and regulations. Uh, they are, you know, it's newer data coming out and, and you see data come out and some people say it's no good and so there's we can acknowledge that nothing's perfect but what is very clear from looking at Colorado data regardless of which study you look at is that uh, there's things that go up right so we definitely know as Meredith mentioned that youth use goes up uh, youth use in Colorado they're number one in the country so we know that past use youth so okay that's you know we're going to be dealing with that and and i'm not going to tell you all about the dangers of youth use because you already know all about that but we know that's coming uh and yeah they have had an increase in traffic accidents and fatalities we, we know that's coming and that's another uh concern you know um the northampton police department has done such a fantastic job on the midnight shift um, they won awards for mad the last two years i think because they're so good at uh, impaired operator enforcement and we haven't had, I mean, it's always, I'm nervous to always say this, but when I, you know, years ago, we used to have a lot of really bad accidents at night. We had fatalities, we had serious injury accidents, we haven't had as many. And I, I believe it's a, as a result of the work that our officers are doing where they're out there. Um, so 
that work is being done. Uh, we, when we got medical marijuana here a few years ago, we did train three of our staff who are drug recognition experts. And I, I don't know how much you all know about our ability to be able to identify marijuana impaired operators. Uh, it's tricky. <laughs> so the, the nice thing about uh, alcohol is it's been around for a long time and there's a science behind it and a lot of laws that are already put in place to help us uh, you know, regulate it, enforcement checks, and you know, if we pull people over even, there's a lot of laws that follow what happens if you make an arrest for someone for drunk driving. Those same things are not necessarily in place for impaired operation uh, with, with drugs. So, uh, for instance, we pull a car over and the person is, is impaired. We, we witness something, whatever they did, something seems off. We take them out of the car, the officer takes them out of the car, gives them field sobriety tests, which we're probably all familiar with, and then the officer may choose to make an arrest at that time. In most cases, if there's impairment shown, they'll make that arrest. And then the person comes to the station, and if you're, in, if you're arrested for alcohol impairment, you have to take a breathalyzer test, and there's a scientific test. You blow into that test, and it tells you what your level of impairment is, and then likewise, there's a law that says if you blow over 08, you're impaired. Um, two things are different regarding marijuana. The first is uh, there's nothing that makes you take any test. So unlike the breathalyzer where if you don't take it, you lose your license for a good amount of time, there's nothing like that for marijuana. So if we say, all right, now you're in the booking room and we want you to do whatever we want you to do, tests, or we want uh, to have a drug recognition expert come in and take, um, you know, do it, take urine, take blood pressure, all that, they can refuse that and there's no penalty. There is a penalty for alcohol. And then, of course, the other thing is for alcohol, there is a very bright line of 0.08, whereas for marijuana, that bright line does not exist. Uh, so that, yep. I just asking, so a field sobriety test in and of itself is not grounds for an arrest? It is grounds for an arrest. So you'll get arrested on the street if you fail field sobriety test. But then when you come into the station, you, you're, you're under arrest and you've been charged, but that's where you, if it's alcohol, you would then take the right. breathalyzer test. So what you have no additional no evidence additional at that evidence point. No additional evidence can be gained. And of course, you know, when people dress up for court a short time later and cut their hair and put a nice outfit on and they're all, you know, it's, it's a whole different, different gotcha. thing. But what if they refuse to do that? To do, refuse which one? The alcohol test. They lose their license for a long time. If they refuse it. Yeah. Yep. yep. So there's a penalty set up in place. There's a law that says I'm requiring you to take this test. If you refuse, then you will lose your license for a long time. So my question, Chief, mm -hmm. if there is strict rules for somebody who's intoxicated, mm -hmm. how can they go ahead and just go ahead and do what they want by allowing marijuana to come into the cities or whatever mm. without no policies put in place. This don't make sense to me. Yeah, I think that's kind of the struggle that a lot of us are facing. And I think when this was all passed, the vision was, well, they'll figure it out kind of thing. How can and they here we are. do this? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. I can only tell you where we are with it now. But so there's a major loophole with impaired operation here. Um, and we have seen, so we do, I keep track, you can look at our open data portal, you can look at impaired operation. Uh, I looked at the numbers we had in 2015, 2% 2 of our OUI arrests were for impairment with drugs. Uh, in 2016 it was 4% and in 2017 it was 7.5%. So we're seeing, you know, I cautiously present that, I mean those are small numbers of people but uh, we're seeing a gentle gradual increase. So we'll certainly continue to keep track of that. Uh, but the complicating part of this also is that if we have impairment uh, and the officer's out on the street and they smell alcohol, they're more likely to charge the OUI alcohol arrest. And it's hard to parcel out what the impairment may be from because they're seeing a lot of multiple substances in people. And that includes marijuana, but also other substances, prescription oh, yeah. medications or anything else. Mm -hmm. But those are so hard to you know, get to the bottom of it, alcohol is much easier. So if someone blows and they're over, it's easier to prove that. But we're definitely seeing combinations of substances that are in, in people uh, when we arrest them for impairment. So, so what that all boils down to for me is the concern about on-site consumption. We're not prepared <laughs> to be able to handle uh, people, we don't have systems in place the way that we do now. If people leave a bar impaired with drug, with alcohol, 
we have systems to deal with that, and, and we don't have that for, mar for marijuana. It's much more challenging. So as I was saying, we do have drug recognition experts. We have three people who can come into the station. If they agree, although there's no penalty if they don't, that drug recognition expert can give a series of tests. And I mentioned a few. They, they take a urine sample. They take blood pressure. They do a pupil dilation measurement. They do all these more medical aspects. And then they're able to decide uh, or put them in one of seven categories of drugs. So it might be depressants, it might be marijuana, it might be whatever it may be. Um, and that's how that works. So then the drug recognition expert goes into court and can testify to which drug class they were able to place them in. Gotcha. So the, it's a fairly complicated and comprehensive process to do. And it's optional. <laughs> and it's optional, right. And is there the equivalent of a Miranda, you have the right to not take this test, you, have, you know, is it? Well, right, I mean, they have to sign off on agreeing to take it and it, it, they, don't have to, they don't have to sign right. off, so. And some do, some don't, it's mixed. Because some people, I think kind of what you said too, is that I don't, you know, people know, I think the education is there around alcohol, where if I've had, you know, whatever, six drinks, I'm gonna be over, you know? But if I've had a half of a brownie or something, there may be a confidence in that, that I'm fine, you know? There, there's not the same kind of understanding that is really well entrenched, like you mentioned in your daughters, and that we all know, like, you, that, education is not there. So I anticipate we're gonna have more problems with, with impaired operators. And, and we have this proven in other, other states where we've seen it play out that way. So on-site consumption would be an area of concern for me. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, uh, one of my other concerns, and again, Meredith mentioned this, was just public consumption, how the city wants to handle that. Uh, I'm not even gonna necessarily make a recommendation on it. I'm just simply presenting it as the city needs to decide what they wanna do with that. Uh, and what we have now is we have a, a city ordinance written for open container of alcohol. Right. So if someone's out drinking a beer on Main Street, that's an arrestable offense. It's a city ordinance, it's an arrestable offense. Um, you could, and other communities are, and I have language from those communities, uh, add into that public consumption of marijuana. Some people are gonna push back and argue that we're criminalizing marijuana. However, I would argue that it doesn't criminalize marijuana any more than it criminalizes alcohol. I mean, it's the same thing. It's we're criminalizing the public consumption and there is a reason for that uh, as far as how it contributes to your streets and also just kind of people being out and about affected by those substances. So it's up, up to the city on how they wanna proceed with that. So one option is have, having it be something that is enveloped in our existing ordinance and adding in the, the public consumption of marijuana. Um, other options, I suppose, would be regulatory, perhaps. Um, that, and the, the tricky part with the, with the regulations from the Board of Health, and I, I think Meredith would agree, is that uh, the enforcement aspect of that. a big problem. Right, so the, the cigarette stuff, we cannot enforce. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and which, you know, we're, we're not that excited to enforce <laughs> that. Uh, however, I mean, more realistically, our officers are the ones that are out on the streets 24 hours a day witnessing this behavior. And more likely to get, you know, we get called for this sort of thing too. If there's someone smoking marijuana in front of the store, we're more likely to get a call about that uh, than say Meredith's office probably. So that's up to the city to decide how they want that or if they want that managed in the well, city. Well, who would do that? Which one? Like you were just talking about an ordinance that we already have in place, Chief, mm -hmm. okay, on open containers. Right. And then adding new language, mm -hmm. which would include the consumption of marijuana. Mm -hmm. So would you be doing that or what? If you added it into the existing ordinance, then we're the enforcement arm for that and it makes it an arrestable offense, so yes. But the other option, if you don't want to do that, is to have it be regulatory or, or put a monetary fine on it or something. Those would be other options. Meredith, what were, were, did, did you mention to me the in Pittsfield the nuisance and, a nuisance, nuisance enforcement officer? officer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was say a little more about that. Yeah. So that was a position I created um, to uh, cover all sorts of nuisances. One of the biggest issues that we had in Pittsfield was blight, and we didn't, you know, our code enforcement team was small, and we didn't have time to deal with the amount of blight. It was during the market, the, you know, when mortgages were being sold over to larger loan companies. It was just a mess out there. So anyways, um, I created a revolving fund and the money that came in from tickets, which was a lot. I want to say it was 15000 the first year I was there. 
helped subsidize this nuisance control officer. But not only did he address blight, he was out boots on the ground every single day, you know, interacting with the public. When it snowed, we had a sidewalk ordinance where you had to clear off your, you know, in front of your property, the snow within, I think, 24 hours. 24 hours. And on 24 hour and one minute, he was out there writing tickets to those who didn't clear off the property. We had a grass ordinance, and if it your grass was over this height. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was well loved in the city. <laughs> So he covered all of these general nuisances that we had, um, but it was specific. You know, it was under 40U. When I think about that, I mean, in theory it's a good idea, but when you just have a guy in plain clothes and no badge behind him or uniform behind him, I don't know what that's going to look like for you know for tobacco and marijuana. You know. Did, did this cover tobacco in it public in Pittsfield? Mm -hmm. No, it didn't. No, we didn't have regulations of the magnitude that we have here in Northampton right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it could because mm -hmm. uh, secondhand smoke is considered a nuisance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is kind of one tricky part of it, when it comes to enforcement is what the expectation is on the enforcer. Like if you're expecting someone who has no protection or you know and they're walking up to someone who's smoking pot and that person is angry or, or anything mm -hmm. else um, there's a bit of a risk there in that mm -hmm. type of position mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with someone who you know may, and, and a lot of folks are you know, there's a lot of folks who are going to be very resistant to any sort of enforcement so uh, I would have a little concern mm -hmm. about whoever that might be that's out there that we're asking to do this for our right. city mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. So that's uh, yeah. Those are those are pretty much my concerns. The youth, youth, the accidents and fatalities. Uh, Meredith already mentioned the increase in ER visits and hospitalizations. That's really well documented in Colorado mm -hmm. as well. Um, their their uh, rehab facilities have seen their numbers have gone up for marijuana addiction. Uh, so I, I of course have concerns about the opioid crisis that we're dealing with and, and hoping that we're not going to have a logjam of people who are seeking uh, you know treatment due to this change. So I have that concern. And then of course, just in general, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what happens to our crime and climate. And Colorado has reported some uh, negative things in those areas, so we'll, we'll just kind of see what happens with that. But those are some concerns that I have. People don't think of marijuana generally as something that crime occurs around, but <coughs> if you read the Rocky Mountain High uh, report, so mm -hmm. what's that? Um, um, it, it's kind of interesting actually there's a lot of uh, they've had a quite an uptick in violent crime around marijuana more sales and robberies between that and when I reflect back on my career here we actually that happens we just had one we just had one two weeks ago where two people pulled guns on a person they knew they were dealing marijuana so like this and we actually just had an overdose call on edibles as well. Oh really? So, yeah, right, right downtown on Main Street. So we're already beginning to see if you know some of these things here. They're not uncommon. I'm not trying to give a sky is falling. I'm not mm -hmm. saying it's going to. I'm simply saying I, I have some concerns about uh, based on the experiences of these other states are having. Where are they getting the edibles? Uh, well, medical the medical marijuana facility sells edibles. And we're, we've actually seen the medical marijuana has already come into the high school. We've seen it uh, being sold illegally in there. So, I mean, and that's to be expected. We're introducing a new substance to our community, and it's going to go through all those areas. This is not going to get rid of the, um, you know, illegal market of marijuana. It will just change it. So, in other words, somebody goes on Cobb Street. Mm -hmm. They have their card. Mm -hmm. They can get it. Yep. So. Then they come out and they're giving it to the young ones. They're selling it and making money off of it. Yep. Oh boy. Yeah, and I mean that happens with alcohol now too. It's not uncommon, of course, to have people, you know, people <coughs> pay people to go into alcohol establishments and buy alcohol. So this is a, a, a you know, age limited substance. We're going to have those same issues. Um, so I, I mean, my overall message is really I just hope we proceed with caution as we watch this come into our community. Um, I know I know what's coming. I just I am always worried about our community. I'm worried about our downtown. I'm worried about the traffic safety. And uh, yeah, so those are the things I'm keeping my eye on. You know, capping the number of establishments. I've heard many many people say, you know, free market will take care of the number of establishments here in Northampton. That may very well be true, but. 
Are we willing to put our money on it? I mean, I really think that I the chance to put a market right, is not going to take care of it. Right. And we are going to have 30 applicants on April 1st submitting their applications to the CCC. And if we don't have any cap in place and they meet all the parameters of the regulation, then we will have 30 establishments here in downtown. So, so on. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Well, related to that is so, yes, there's the application, but they can't open until they have a signed host agreement. <coughs> and they're not guaranteed a host agreement by us. So, that's a place where we can actually regulate the number. We can say we're going to, rather than say, that could be the way we regulate the number of businesses, saying we are going to cap it at 10 host agreements or whatever that. People can apply all they want. I'm, do, I'm just looking for the mechanism for how we do this. I don't think, uh, that's not my interpretation. I think your siting and your capping has to be done before April 1st. The CCC has to have those requirements for a community before April 1st. Otherwise, it's a free-for-all. So we'll, we'll have hosting agreements, but you now can't prohibit the number in a hosting agreement. That's my interpretation. Might as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so for example, if if we said, okay, by ordinance, it's cap of ten, <laughs> cap of number, and there were the thirty applications that went in. CCC sorts out which ten of the thirty. How does that work? I'm not really positive how that happens. It might be the first ten that are approved by CCC, mm -hmm. but I don't want to say that 100. Right. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. But, but the selection of the 10 of the 30 would not happen at the local level? No. Mm -mm. Nope. They would have to meet the CCC, and then they would have to adhere to any host agreement that we have in place, too. And I don't think, I think the host agreement has to be uniform also. I don't think you can have specific parameters by establishment. But again, I don't, you know, it might be too early to say that. Mm -hmm. But that's what it's looking like right now. And the, C the, the draft regulation says, at a minimum, you have to have, if you didn't vote it out, you have to have 20%, allow 20% of your retail establishments, your uh, alcohol retail establishments. And we have 17 retail, alcohol retail establishments right now, so if you do the math, we have to allow 3.4 recreational marijuana establishments. Now that's just recreational marijuana establishments. If we set the cap at four, say, for recreational marijuana establishments, that does not include social consumption or anything else that might be down the road. So you just need to think about that too. So you, you've clearly thought about this cap question. Mm -hmm. Thought only a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. Thought a lot more about it. What, what would be your recommendation? I think you should have a cap. And what should that cap be? What is that number? <laughs> 3.4. Because the, it's, you can't go back. That's mm -hmm. why. Is that there's no reason. We you you mentioned like things are not in place. We're right. not ready for this as a, as a state and everyone's scrambling, doing mm -hmm. the same thing, boards of health, police departments, mm -hmm. city councils. It's we're not ready. So why open the flood floodgates when mm -hmm. we're not ready? Just start low and, and see start how low and adjust mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a cap at 3.4. So practically speaking, is that three or is that four? Well, my <laughs> grade school math taught me you always round up or yeah. down. Uh, the so five is the magic number, yeah. so I have to say three. <laughs> um, yeah. So do we know of uh, in Colorado or Oregon any towns that imposed a cap? And how they went about it? What, did they have the, the latitude that we have here, or was was it no uh, communities had no control over what was going on? Well, just just the research that I've done is they passed it, and they've been backpedaling ever since on every different level on caps, on requirements to enter, on edible products. I mean, it's okay. They made, you know, they didn't think it through thoroughly, and then when it was there, and they realized all of the impacts it had on them, they started backtrack, backtracking, and, and putting regulations in place. But I can't speak specifically to the cap; it's just kind of 
an over I, I'd be interested in knowing, you know, rec marijuana. what cities and towns out there actually imposed the cap and how they went about it and what their methodology mm -hmm. was and what they learned. And I mean, there's two whole states that did this. So, well, well D Denver. I'm just, I'm just looking at this, this. Oh, this, God, well, yeah, look this, at you. This, uh, <laughs> what is it, the, we, the, the weed maps document. Denver did it on the basis of one retailer per 21, 2,152 residents. Portland on the basis of 4,475, Portland, Oregon. But there's this research, I don't know what it is, it says the optimal density level is one per 7,500. So if you apply that, you, you, you get between three and four for, for you know, mm -hmm. for, for to the extent that that's, you know, supportable by mm -hmm. something. Um, they had more marijuana establishments than Starbucks. In, in Colorado. It, it that's is, in it, the Rocky Mountain study. I thought that was interesting. I don't, I don't, I don't doubt it. I was in Durango <laughs> summer before last <laughs> and it's unbelievable. It is And we have to do something by April 1st? Or, well, I, is, is it too late to pass a moratorium to give us more time? Uh, we can't do a moratorium. Why? Because the residents here voted for no. 85%. Oh, yeah, I know. But no, just to give us more time to think the process through. We can't do a moratorium saying no retail establishments at all, but we could buy more time. Yeah, I'm not sure we could do that. Yeah, I know either. We can, but I'm not sure we have time. I don't know how to do a moratorium in a city, so I wouldn't know yeah. like how many council meetings happen. Yeah, there. that 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 might be a little that might be a little late on that. I'm not sure, but on on, on the cap, the zoning has to be in place by April. But but if there were a cap, that's not a zoning ordinance. Is, does that also have to be in place by April one? Oh, I guess because that's when the licenses are yeah. received, so yeah. it would be. Mm -hmm. hmm. Applications. And has the CCC officially finished? Are they still talking about what these rules are? Have March 15th. So March 15th, yeah. so they're going to give us two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a pretty clear idea. There's not going to be a lot of changes from what we've last seen and what was, because last, cause last week there were a few mm -hmm. tweaks, mm -hmm. like wait until October 1 yeah. on social. Have you brought this up to the mayor, Meredith, about a moratorium? I have once, and he was under the impression it couldn't be done. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But I don't know why. Yeah, my understanding was. It oh, well, this says no later than well, this is an early no no later than June of 2018. So another that's community just no last week passed a moratorium. Could it? Uh, For what? I'm, I'm getting more time to get their public policy and Where regulations. I think it was Southampton or South Hadley. South Hadley. South Hadley. Hadley. South Hadley I think. Yeah, yeah, it was just last week or the week before yeah. they passed the moratorium. Right. That's out of my wheelhouse, though. I, you know, I don't even know right. I think it's what the process is here. to do that. So, I think it'd be helpful for us to have some legal advice, or I mean, like, you know. It would be great if Alan had looked, you know, if the city solicitor has really gone through this stuff and that we could, you know, run some ideas behind, you know, buy them around mm -hmm. moratoriums and caps and whatever. The woman from Netta, the lawyer from Netta, I think would be a great resource because not That's only is true. she from Netta, she helped the CCC with the regulation. I mean, I, and she was very open to. What was her name? I can't remember um, offhand. But yeah, she well, said okay. anything I've got you know, a call or email her. Yeah, she would know. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, was. she might not know the logistics of local government, but I think she'll know the people, the right mm -hmm. people to ask. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Alan Seawall would know, too, hmm. about the moratorium. Mm -hmm. You might want to put together a little study group with Solicitor Seawall. Yeah, sure. So, um, let's look at this. To, to basically to consider your recommendations mm -hmm. and think about the practicality and the logistics of ordinance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot to think about in a very short amount of time is. 
Well, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And so I assume you would be available as we study this and ponder it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you. Can Thank I just ask? Yes, go ahead. The reference to 3%, there's two different 3%s, right? There's the 3% mm -hmm. sales tax, mm -hmm. and then there's the opportunity to oh, go 3% yeah. in the in the, in the individual uh, host agreement. In the host agreement, right. That's mm -hmm. separate from mm -hmm. the 3% sales tax that's remitted back from the state. Do I have that right? So I think it's six in total, right? We've got yeah, our 3%, yeah, six in right. total. Yeah. yeah, we're saying the same. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is what I found out the other night through yeah. my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, very interesting. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, so I'm available, email, phone, if you have any specific questions, feel free. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let, the, let the minutes show. Wait, are we going to give you more questions than answers? <laughs> Wasn't meant to be that way. Like, well, that's the nature. I know. Mm -hmm. what, what, what else do we need to know while we ponder all this? I got it all. You got it all. There's a lot to ponder. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I want to thank you both for coming in today. This was really, really informative and helpful and helped got the wheels going on, you know, these ideas that a lot of citizens have been talking about. And we can start poking around to see, yeah. look for ideas that will work and fit. And yeah. So. I worked quite a bit. Good. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, very no, Thank you both very much. Got other stuff to do here, right? Okay. Um, I need five, um, which we had referrals to our committee. Um, 18-025 appointments to housing partnership, a license commission, and the trust fund committee. And this was all referred to city services on February 1st, 2018. and appointment to housing partnership, which is I. I did talk with Julio Els, and he also sent me an email. He wrote a lengthy one, and if you look at his resume, he's pretty well saying how he actually does feel about why and why he would like to be on housing partnership um, because he found it for himself to be very difficult to be able to buy a home in Northampton but he was able to buy a home on Fort Street but it's his two sons where he has concerns about and he just felt that because of the difficulties even with his two sons finding an apartment that it really made him aware of affordability problem here in our city. And he has the two adults with disabilities who now live at the McDonald house, in which he says is a great place for them to live. But while they were waiting to be offered an apartment through public housing, we looked around extensively to try to find a place they could rent together, and we couldn't find any housing that would rent to them, even with me as their sponsor as far as the money that they could afford. And even with him making a substantial contribution, he found that it was a little alarming on how difficult it was to get housing for his two sons. He lives up a Fort Street and he has a wonderful street that feels like a neighborhood. And there are people there who grew up on the street. Others are longtime residents. Others are brand new renters. Some are families, some have children, and some are single. Some are young, some are old. To meet the needs of a diverse population, we need a variety of housing options throughout the city. And I know we've heard plenty of that. 
Diverse neighborhoods are stronger neighborhoods, but it all starts with housing. He would like to see more streets like mine in Northampton, but with even more affordable options. And he does believe that we need to make Northampton a welcoming city to a more racially and ethically diverse population. But that is not going to happen without affordable, more affordable housing options. And he also feels that Northampton needs to remain affordable for people who were born here and grew up here. So he is saying that he's not a housing expert, but wouldn't even say that I'm well informed yet. But I know that the city is already working on affordable housing projects. I want to learn more about those projects and to be part of the planning of the future. And he is a great believer in downtown. He has seen too much towns die because the downtowns die. We have opportunities to create great new housing options in Northampton, downtown and elsewhere, both at market rate and at affordable rates for medium and low income residents. I think we have the opportunity to become a model for other small cities. And he thanks us for hearing about his concerns and, like, and why he would like to be on the housing partnership. So I am making um, a positive recommendation for our committee to send this to full city council. All in favor? Aye. Dennis Bidwell, Councilor Bidwell, um, License Commission. I spoke to Helen Kahn, who um, is one of the uh, former co owners of Cotton Top Restaurant in Florence. And uh, it was through that that she had some exposure to the work of the license board. Um, she was approached to serve on the board and would look forward to doing so. Um, there's a variety of interesting issues coming before the license board. Liquid license, of course, is always there, but um, it's conceivable that Airbnb issues would at some point come before the, 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 that body, which interests her. Um, so I think she'd be a tremendous addition to the that body, so I would make a positive recommendation to Helen Conn for license board, license commission. I yes. second that. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Then we have the trust fund committee with Jerry Bunker, Chair Nash, Councilor Nash. Yeah, so um, I spoke with Jerry and um, that he's, you know, this is for a reappointment, he's been a part of the trust fund committee uh, going back to. Um, who was the previous treasurer, George Zimmerman. Zimmerman, and you know, and he spoke very fondly of, of working with George to uh, go through all of the city. The, the trust fund manages the city's investments. Uh, they, they, they. Um, we have a portfolio of, it, of investments, and they oversee where those funds are invested. Um, that um, Jerry shared that things were not well organized when he first joined that committee and worked with uh, with George and other members to really straighten things out. Uh, that they were able to um, do things such as uh, divest of oil and tobacco um, uh, investments and, and, and in general just got things much more organized. <laughs> and, um, and and he really, he really um, uh, he, he understands the, the, the importance of the work that's done on the trust fund and, um, and enthusiastically wants to keep doing it. And, um, and I see no reason not to. So I, um, I would like to put forth a positive recommendation for Mr. Butler. I would second that. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so we have made a full recommendation to City Council on Housing Partnership for Junior Alps, 35 Fort Hill Terrace, License Commission Helen J. Kahn of 188 Federal Street, Florence, and Trust Fund Committee Jerry Bunker on a reappointment to full City Council with our recommendation. 
Sounds good. Any movement? That's no. Adjourned. A motion to adjourn. Second. Aye.